Um, I want to speak to you this morning about spiritual warfare. And I want to begin with an interesting scripture in Judges chapter 3, verse 1 to 4. Joshua led Israel into the promised land, and they conquered much of the promised land that God had promised them through Moses. However, they didn't conquer all the land. And this is what God said to the people of Israel concerning that. This is what it reads. These are the nations the Lord left to test all those Israelites who had not experienced any of the wars in Canaan. He did this only to teach warfare to the descendants of the Israelites who had not had previous battle experience. The nations, the five rulers of the Philistines, all the Canaanites, the Sidonians, the Hivites living in the Lebanon mountains from Mount Baal Hermon to Lebo Hamat. These nations were left to test the Israelites to see whether they would obey the Lord's command, which he had given their forefathers through Moses. So the battle was not over. The conflict had not finished. There was still land to possess. But in order to possess it, the people had to be able to warfare against the enemy. Because... Enemies want to rob us of our inheritance. That's what enemies do. They steal. They plunder. And so God wanted his people to be ready on a daily basis to resist the enemy. That is why God left some of the nations in order to test the Israelites and teach them warfare. Now, the New Testament takes up the same theme of spiritual warfare. And there's two scriptures I'd like to quote by way of introduction. Ephesians 6, verse 12. Paul says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And then he also wrote 2 Corinthians 10 with the very same message. And he says this, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not like the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. And we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to make it obedient to Christ. Now it's interesting that in the Old Testament, the children of Israel fought many physical battles over land, territory. But behind those battles were dark spiritual forces. But when we come to the New Testament, the battles we face are no longer over physical land or territory. The opposition is spiritual forces. And although the devil does use flesh and blood people to fight against us, the powers behind those flesh and blood oppositions are essentially spiritual. You know, when Jesus spoke about building his church, he talked of overcoming the schemes and strategies of hell. And therefore, this warfare that we are involved in, without any question, is very much a battle against the devil's schemes and strategies. 
Now, the gates of hell, Jesus said, the gates of hell will not prevail against his church. They're not physical gates. The gates is a picture of what happened in the Old Testament. There used to be two gates into a city, the outer and the inner. And the elders of the city used to sit between the two gates and take counsel. They would devise strategies. They would set up schemes to promote their cause and to resist the opposition. And by the very same token, the devil today, he has many schemes and strategies designed to oppose us and to bring us down. And that is why spiritual warfare is a necessity. Spiritual warfare is a reality in today's world for those of us that are Christians. And as I've said, the Old Testament, the battles were physical with spiritual undertones. But in the New Testament, the spirit, it's spiritual with physical undertones themes as well. You see, this spiritual warfare has been going on since day one, since Adam was in the Garden of Eden. Why? Because Satan is against everything that God is for. That's the, that's the bottom line. Satan is against everything that God is for. You know, when God chose Israel to be his special people, there is a sense in which God almost set them up. Why? Because Satan is against everything God is for. God was for Israel. He chose Israel. He set them apart as his special people. And he chose Israel to be the very vehicle through which he would bring Messiah into the world. And that is why Satan has tried every which way to destroy Israel ever since. Because Israel represents the purposes of God on the earth. And as I've said, God chose Israel to be the vehicle that would bring Messiah into the world. And this upset Satan very much. Now, there are a number of very clear examples of the principle of spiritual warfare in the Old Testament through Satan's attacks on Israel. For example, Exodus 17, where we read the story of how Moses and Joshua defeated the Amalekites. But just to go back a little bit here, you know, when Abraham and Sarah were around, again, Satan threw a massive spanner in the works. Because, as you know, Sarah was 90 and childless. And yet God had promised them a son. I mean, Abraham was 99. I don't think too many people expect to have a child when you're 90, if anybody. So Sarah suggests to Abraham that because she has not been able to produce a child, that she, he should take a servant girl, Hagar the Egyptian, and have a child by her, and let that one become the son of promise. Well, that's what happened. Ishmael was born of the flesh. It was man's idea, not God's idea. God promised a son through Sarah. But Sarah, thinking that she was never going to bear a son, made the suggestion to Abraham, who took it on board, had a child by Hagar called Ishmael. But as it was clearly stated at the time, Ishmael was not the son of promise. And so, eventually, Sarah produced a son. 
at the grand age of 90 called Isaac. And Isaac was the son of promise. He was the one that God promised all along. But now you've got two sons. Technically, Ishmael was the firstborn. Isaac was the secondborn. But God said Isaac was the son of promise. And so Ishmael was displaced. That didn't go down well. He hated the thought that although he was Abraham's firstborn, he would not inherit the firstborn's inheritance. Because he was born out of the flesh, unbelief. Do you know something? You come down to Jacob and Esau. Esau was also displaced. Remember, he came in one day and he was the firstborn, Esau. So the inheritance went to him. But when he came in from the field one day, his brother Jacob was cooking up a stew. And boy, it just went to Esau's head. And basically what he said to Jacob was, if you give me some of that stew, I'm starving, I'm famished. You can have the inheritance. Well, that's what he did. And Jacob effectively displaced Esau twice. This didn't go down well with Esau. As a result, Esau married out of the clan. He married the daughter of Ishmael. You get the connection. Ishmael, resentful, unforgiving, bitter about being displaced as the son of promise. And now he produces a relationship with Esau, one of Esau's sons. Esau married the daughter of Ishmael to spite his father and mother. That's what he was doing. He was working out his frustration because he'd lost his inheritance. And I believe that Ishmael's resentment passed down through the family line. And you know something? It's still present in Islam today. The battle between Israel and Islam is the longest running family feud in human history. Because Islam teaches that Ishmael was the son of promise. Islam teaches that it was Ishmael that Abraham was to sacrifice on Mount Moriah, but the Bible says differently. But then something else happened. One of Esau's sons had a concubine. A concubine was not a wife, it was almost like a mistress. She bore him Amalek. Ishmael, Esau, bitterly resentful, Amalek carried the same feelings of hostility. And Amalek became one of the fiercest enemies that Israel ever had to face. And you know the story of Haman, the story of Esther. Haman was an Amalekite. He had a pathological hatred of the Jews. I mean, it was built into him. Well, Exodus 17 tells the story. When the Israelites were released from, the Red, from Egypt through the Red Sea, the first group of people that stopped them in their tracks was Amalek, the Amalekites. Harrying all that hatred and hostility. But you know, it was not just a physical battle. Because we read in the story of, Mos uh, of Aaron and Hur and Moses. Joshua was on the battlefield fighting a military battle. Moses was praying. And the Bible tells us that every time Moses lifted his hands in prayer... 
the battle turned for Israel. But every time he put his hands down and stopped praying, the battle turned against Israel. So it's clear that the connection is that the spiritual element of this battle was Moses' prayer. The physical element was the military conflict. Eventually, in order to strengthen Moses, Aaron and Hur sit, sat him on a rock and lifted his, kept his hands lifted up. Eventually, Israel won the battle. Not because of sword and spear, but because of the power of prayer. So behind the Amalekites was a demonic force which they overcame. And then we move to 1 Samuel 17, the story of David and Goliath. Now, Goliath was nine foot six tall, so he was a rather big guy. David, on, in contrast, was a 17-year-old teenager, fresh from the sheepfolds. And you know what happened? Every single day, the Israelites set up in battle array, went out to meet the Philistines, but never fought. And the Philistines taunted them and said, give us a man that we may fight, our giant Goliath. If he wins, you serve us. If, he, if your man wins, we serve you. There was not one volunteer. Nobody ventured to say, I'll go and fight, until David came along which really upset his brothers. But eventually, David was chosen. First of all, he tried on Saul's armor. Well, can you imagine? Saul was probably about six foot, and David was about five foot. Can you imagine David putting on Saul's armor? All that heavy stuff, great big sword, helmet, protection. He couldn't walk in it. He said, I'm not, I'm not used to this. I'm not tried this. Let me do it my own way. All he had was a sling with five stones. That's all he had. No weapon, no sword, no shield. And he went out to fight Goliath. And this is what he said to Goliath. And not only that, David actually ran to meet Goliath. He didn't shuffle it nervously towards him. He ran to meet him. <coughs> he relished the challenge. And this is what David said to Goliath. You come against me with sword, spear, and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel. See? Military, spiritual. Physical, spiritual. David said, I'm not coming to you with weapons. I'm coming to you in the name of the Lord. And you know what? He was a skilled slingsman. He, he didn't sling his first stone at Goliath. He had practiced and practiced and practiced and practiced. Man, he could hit a target at a distance. He was so skilled. It, it wasn't a miracle that he could sling a, a stone. It was the fact that he had made adequate preparation. And he, he just swung one stone. And it hit Goliath right in the temple. Knocked him out. He ran forward and took his sword and cut his head off. End of story. It was not a physical battle. It was a spiritual battle. Because Daniel came against, the David came against Goliath in the name of the Lord. And then 2 Chronicles 20, King Jehoshaphat, he's being invaded by three different armies, which must have been a combined number of, of men. Jehoshaphat sought the Lord, and the Lord gave him a strategy as to how to overcome these three armies that were coming to rob them <coughs> of their inheritance. The strategy, you've never heard of it before. God said to Jehoshaphat, 
put the singers in front of the soldiers. Who's ever heard of that as a strategy for war? The choir in front of the soldiers, in front of the army. It's a recipe for disaster, surely. But that's exactly what Jehoshaphat did. In obedience to God's command, and against all the odds, humanly speaking, Jehoshaphat sent the singers in front of the soldiers. And they were singing of the mercies of God. They were praising the Lord. And the three armies were unnerved. They, had, they didn't know what to think. They didn't know what to expect. They had never experienced a battle like this. No swords, no spears, no shields, no armory, nothing. Just songs of praise. You know what? Those three armies were paralyzed by the power of praise. Praise brought the victory, not weapons. Because behind those armies were demonic forces driving them forward. But praise brought the victory. Psalm 149 verse 6 says, May the praise of God be in their mouths to bind their kings with fetters, their nobles with shackles of iron. And eventually those three armies began to fight each other. They were so confused by this picture of singers in front of the army. They began to fight each other. Israel, and God said to them, to Israel, you won't have to fight this battle. Just do what I tell you. Sing my praises. Then, <clears throat> Daniel 10. Daniel had been praying for 21 days without a response. He was beginning to feel a little bit sorry for himself. He couldn't understand why God had not answered his prayer. And suddenly, the angel of the Lord appears to him, gives him a tremendous commendation for his faithfulness in praying. He says, Daniel, what you don't know is your prayer was answered on day one. But as I was sent from heaven to earth with the answer concerning your prayers, I met resistance. The prince of Persia, and you know over every nation there's a spiritual power. The prince of Persia was the one that controlled Persia, uh, the empire of the day. In fact, they had to call in extra angels to support this battle that was taking place, including Michael, the archangel, who is the protector of Israel. Well, the battle was won. It was a spiritual battle, a battle in the heavenlies. It wasn't on the earth, it wasn't a flesh and blood battle. It was a pure spiritual battle. And do you know the reason why this battle took place? And what it was over? It was over Jerusalem. God had promised to restore Jerusalem. And Satan didn't want that. Because Jerusalem represents the throne of God on earth. And so he did his utmost to prevent the answer to Daniel's prayers getting through to him. But Daniel won the day because the angels won the battle. The last Old Testament illustration is from the book of Esther. It's a wonderful story of deliverance which Esther led through prayer and fasting. You see, wicked Haman, one of the Amalekites, he was so consumed with hatred for the Jews. He came within a whisker of destroying them. He got the king of Persia to agree to a decree that on a given day, sometime in the future, 
all the Jews would be wiped out. At the same time, on the same day, and they would be no more. Sounds a bit like Hitler, doesn't it? He even set the date. But his plans were thwarted in the nick of time. Why? Because Mordecai and Esther called the people to prayer and fasting. There was a physical plan in place to exterminate the Jews. But Mordecai and Esther inspired a prayer response. And the people of Israel, the Jews, began to pray, intercede, and fast. And all is revealed. And to me, this is one of my very favorite Bible verses. Ex Esther 6 verse 13. Mordecai had a bad, uh, rather Haman had a bad day at the office. He'd been invited by Queen Esther to have a banquet with the king twice. And this went to his head. And all of a sudden he thought he was Mr. Popular. But it all went flat because Esther exposed Haman's plan to the king. And the king was very angry. So by the time Haman got, got home from the office, he was not in a good mood. <clears throat> and then his wife spoke. We don't know her name, but boy, she said something so profound. And this is what she said to Haman, who was feeling very, very down. Because his plan was unraveling. She said, since Mordecai before whom your downfall has already started, is of Jewish origin, you cannot stand against him, you will surely come to ruin. What a statement. From a heathen, idolatrous woman who hated the Jews as much as her husband, but she came to the realization that because Mordecai was of a Jewish background, he was virtually untouchable because God loved his people and protected them. If he's of Jewish origin, forget it. You can't stand against him. You'll surely come to ruin. And he finished up being hanged on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Folks, this is an enduring principle where Israel has, God has chosen Israel as his special people and he has protected them over millennia. You see, if God's for you, who can be against you? Simple as that. So those are a few examples of the Old Testament demonstrating that the battle we're fighting is spiritual, not physical. We move to the New Testament. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem, Satan saw another opportunity to thwart God's plans. So he incited a, a neurotic King Herod. And when the wise men came to King Herod, they explained to him, quoting Micah 5.2, about the baby that would be born in Bethlehem, who would be, who would be the Jewish Messiah. Well, of course, he was neurotic. He was very nervous. That's why he killed so many of his family members, because he didn't trust anybody. They, he thought they were all out to get him. Well, here's another one. Here's a baby born, king of the Jews, threat to his throne, threat to his kingdom. So, having been told by the wise men about this, he hatched a plot to have all the male babies under two years of age, in Bethlehem, murdered. That was his plan. To kill all male babies under two years of age in Bethlehem. Hoping that Jesus would be amongst them. But the plot backfired. And Mary and Joseph and J Jesus fled to Egypt. But then tr Satan tried again. When Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, Satan tried to smooth talk Jesus into giving up his life's calling.
But again, he failed. And do you know Jesus' motive defense? When Satan tempted him, tested him, three times he tempted him. Three times Jesus quoted one verse in the Bible. That's all. Listen, the devil is not so big you've got to throw the whole book at him. One scripture will do it. Three times. He, he simply quoted the word of God. And then the devil tried to quote the Bible. But he only quoted part of it to suit his own cause. Jesus overcame him by the word of God. That's a spiritual weapon. And we move on to the cross. And Satan really thought he had Jesus where he wanted him. On the cross, helpless. And although Jesus did cry whilst hanging on the cross, it is finished. He was not saying, I am finished. He was saying, it, the work of redemption. And then just three days later, he broke the bands of death. And Satan and his hordes were totally humiliated. To the extent that Jesus now announced, he's got the keys of death and hell. No longer in Satan's hands. And so now Satan's got two problems. He's got the Jews who survived every attempt to wipe them out for 2,000 years or more. Now he's got the church to deal with. And the church is still alive and well today, 2,000 years after it started. He's failed on both counts. Psalm 83 sums up very well Israel's history of persecution. O oh God, do not keep silent. Be not quiet, O oh God. Be not still. See how your enemies are astir, how your foes rear their heads. With cunning they conspire against your people. They plot against you, those you cherish. Come, they say, let us destroy them as a nation, that the name of Israel be remembered no more. With one mind they plot together, they form an alliance against you. All the nations against Israel. Psalm 129 says, verse 1 to 3. They have greatly oppressed me since my youth, let Israel say. In, in other words, from the beginning. They have greatly oppressed me from my youth, but they have not gained the victory over me. Plowmen have plowed my back and made their furrow long. But the Lord is righteous. He has cut me free from the cords of the wicked. The church is the same. Over 2,000 years, it has continued to survive and thrive. Even though it has been attacked severely many, many times. Right up until the present day. You know, I I'm, never cease to be amazed how that Islam, to me today, seems to be a protected species. They get away with everything. With murder. In fact, there was a case in the paper yesterday of a mosque in Birmingham where the leader is an absolute radical. And he's been preaching fiery sermons about how women should be stoned for adultery. In this, in this country, he upholds stoning of women for, being, for committing adultery. He had a two million grant from the government which has been blocked for the moment, thank God. It's one of the rare occasions that Islam has been called, called you know, to call before the authorities. If a Christian speaks a word against homosexuality, they lose their jobs. They have their bank account closed. Islam openly teaches that homosexuals should be thrown from rooftops, should be murdered. Not a word is said. Religion of peace? I don't think so. And you know something? 
talking about persecution of the church. The church is under attack severely. Not only in other parts of the world, but here. But, you know, for example, Nigeria. 90% of all Christians killed in the world are in Nigeria. By Islamic militants. Not one word of protest is heard at the UN. Or criticism. Of course, in the Western world, the battles we face are a little bit different. We're attacked mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. And do you know something? I'm not the bearer of gloom and doom. I don't believe in doom and gloom. But I think it's going to get worse for the moment. But I definitely know it's going to get better too. The worse is not going to last forever. Because we are on the winning side. But Jesus said, didn't he? I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not be able to prevail against it. Do you know something? The church is growing fastest in Iran. Hard to believe. Such a hard line. Islamic government. The church is growing faster in Iran than anywhere else on earth. And it continues to grow in North Korea, Afghanistan, China, Myanmar, just to mention a few nations, the church is thriving. As the saying goes, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And of course, India and Pakistan have their problems too with persecution. I must be finishing. I'm not going to finish today. But there is another element to this that needs to be said. And it, it brings this element of spiritual warfare very much into the fore. The church, sadly, there's a twist in the tale. The church has been persecuted. But the church has been a major persecutor of the Jewish people. The best part of 2,000 years. There's something very irrational about anti-Semitism. Considering that the church's very existence derives from Jewish roots. We are rooted with Jewish roots. The church was born because of the Jews. As you know something... The, the most tragic thing to compound this hostility Satan incited Adolf Hitler to devise the final solution based on the teachings of Martin Luther the great reformer he used a Christian to def defend his arguments for exterminating the Jews And you know something? If Satan had been able to eradicate the Jews, God's reputation would have been shot through. Because God has always promised to look after his people. Incidentally, I wrote an article for the Elam's Direction magazine, which was not in the current one, but in the previous one, Our Debt to the Jews. Since then, I've had a contact from a gentleman who's very much into Israel, and he's got it reproduced in the British Church newspaper, in the magazine Prophecy Today, in the Israel online magazine, Israel Today, and on a platform in America. He was so touched by the article. But you know something? The final solution failed. In fact... Within three years, after the greatest tragedy ever to befall the Jewish people, Israel was reborn as a nation. And today, is one of the most successful nations on the earth. After only 75 years of modern existence, truly remarkable and quite miraculous. Then, of course, and this, with this I'm going to close and 
Maybe we'll continue the next on another occasion. Another spanner was thrown into the works. Israel reborn. Islam revived. When I was at school, we used to have a subject called comparative religions. Islam was not called Islam, it was called Mohammedanism. Obscure, harmless, dormant, of no consequence, no threat to the world. But when Israel became a nation, all of a sudden, Islam revived. And today you have a fundamentalist Islam that is totally dedicated to the destruction of Israel. Isaac, Ishmael, it's the same story. It's the same battle. Spiritual warfare. Only after Israel was revived was Islam also revived. And whereas Israel's battles in the past were mainly military, physical, there is no question. It, today it's very spiritual. Far from bringing peace, Israel's restoration only produced conflict and hostility. And there are three areas of contention. The Jewish people themselves, the land of Israel, and the future of Jerusalem. That is where it's going to finish up. That's where the battles are going to come. But it's primarily spiritual. So I just want to challenge you today to be aware we are in a battle. And we need to use spiritual weapons to fight spiritual battles. The Bible, prayer, praise, intercession, the blood of Jesus, the name of Jesus, these are all powerful weapons that will put the enemy to flight. We must never lose sight of it. It's got nothing to do with flesh and blood. It's spiritual. And I just pray that today that you will look, have a look into these things and accept the challenge and become prepared because we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. But we know the end of the story. May the Lord bless you. Amen.